Wow, I feel like I'm at an AA meeting. Um, and uh, so, okay, to start with, first of all, it's nice to be back here. Um, and yes, I, my brain is a little befuddled from insomnia and altitude. So if I spend the next hour just rambling on incoherently, just put up with it. Um, and so I wanted to start, this is kind of like an AA meeting, basically how I first got involved in the world of music. Um, and also something now that, because I spend a lot of time, as I'm sure many people do as well, watching and listening to TED Talks. And there's something about being a white guy in front of an audience where I just feel like I'm giving a TED Talk. <laughs> and I feel like they all have this same cadence. Like they all start like, what if I told you that they're... <laughs> um, so, okay, so... Um, I first experienced music, or what I, my first memory of music was when I was three and a half years old. And I'm 48 years old now, and I was in the car with my mom, and we had this crummy old falling apart Plymouth something or other. Um, I don't even know if Plymouth exists as a car company anymore. And uh, Proud Mary by Creedence Clearwater Revival came on the radio, and I was transfixed. And we pulled up to our apartment, and I refused to get out of the car until the song had ended. And I was just utterly, utterly consumed with this piece of music. And that was sort of the beginning of my obsession with music. And then when I was nine or 10 years old, um, I found a couple of dollars, which was a windfall. And all I wanted to do was go to the local, the version of Walmart that existed then, Bradley's. This is kind of like a down market Walmart, which probably isn't even conceivable. Um, <clears throat> And I bought two singles. I, and the single I was most obsessed with, well, I bought Live and Let Die by Paul McCartney and Wings because it terrified me. It literally did every, I mean, as a nine or 10 year old, I would listen to this song and just be like, because it starts off so innocent and you think to yourself, oh, this is Paul McCartney. He's my friend from the Beatles. He wouldn't do anything scary. And it starts off all gentle and then it gets so malignant and scary. And I was obsessed with that as a nine year old. <laughs> and the other single I bought, and I don't know if anyone here will remember it, was Convoy by C.W. McCall. Anyone? Okay, one person. Two, three. Um, now I feel like I'm at a church revival. It's like, do you know this song? And I literally, not to indulge in hyperbole, I sat down and I listened to that record 40 times in a row. I put the needle down, um, listened to the record, picked it up, listened again, listened again. It was just this obsession. And I think at that moment, I knew that my entire life was going to be spent dedicated to listening to music. Um, I just started playing guitar, so it was dedicated to making music and thinking about music and talking about music. It was pretty much all that I cared about. Uh, and like music and girls. But <laughs> when I was growing up, music reciprocated my love much more than the ladies did. <laughs> so I obsessively played guitar, and when I wasn't playing guitar, I was listening to records. And I was, when I wasn't playing guitar or listening to records, I was talking about playing guitar or talking about listening to records or saving up my money to buy music magazines. And it was my entire life. And it literally, you know, I would, I would dress up like my musical heroes, and I would go to school and listen to cassettes on my Walkman. Um, the only times I ever skipped class were to read a book or listen to a record, which is kind of sad. I think most people skip class to do like legitimate things like take drugs. <laughs> and um, so, so this was my life, just dedicated to music. Um, I went to the University of Connecticut and studied philosophy because I wanted to have a lucrative career as a community <laughs> college teacher. And I dropped out <clears throat> and became a musician. And I was living in an abandoned factory. I had no running water, no bathroom, but I had free electricity so I could make music. And so the, again, I'm in, into my 20s. All I was doing was working on music, listening to music, thinking about music, desperately trying to get a record contract, trying to get DJ work. Because DJing to me seemed like this perfect way of like having a job in the world of music. Because I couldn't have a job as a guitarist and I couldn't have a job as a bongo player, or maybe I could somewhere, 
like at a, one of those Jimmy Buffett resorts. But, <laughs> um, and then I finally was able to move into New York and I got a record contract and I dedicated my entire life to music. But the entire time I was doing this, like my life was dedicated to music, but I thought that music was frivolous. You know, I was like, oh, it's something, it's fun, but it's not, it's not real. You know, it's like, it's just, it's music. It's what I love, but it's entertainment. It's lighthearted. And even though it affects me profoundly and it affects other people profoundly and it affects audiences profoundly, I still gave it short shrift. By the way, does anyone, do you ever say long shrift? <laughs> like, or extended shrift? Like, it, does shrift exist as a word outside of short shrift? Okay, so I would always give it short, non-extended shrift. And, and I just thought this is, you know, music, it's like literature, it's like movies, it's like fun, it's, you know, it's distracting, diverting entertainment. And, and then my career started to do well, so I was even more involved in the world of music. And I guess about 12, no, 13 years ago, uh, and this is sort of a circuitous sort of tangent. Um, one of my best friends when I was 18 and 19, he was one of my drinking and drug buddies. Um, when I met him, he was playing in a punk rock band and he had an eight inch tall mohawk and he sold drugs to clueless NYU students. Um, and, but he came from a sort of affluent New York family and his dad had been the head of a, the, the, chairman of the board of a big hospital in New York. And when his dad stopped doing that, he started working with the neuroscientist Oliver Sacks on this Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. And so about 12 or 13 years ago, I got a call from Eddie, that's the drug dealer's dad, drug dealer, Eddie's dad. And clearly I did a lot of those drugs too. And Eddie's dad called me and said, oh, I'm working with Oliver Sacks at the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. Would you have any interest in coming up to the Institute and seeing what we do? And I thought like, well, sure. But what I, I like, it just didn't make any sense to me that there was such a thing as an Institute for Music and Neurologic Function. Um, it seemed like it'd be like having like the Institute for Puppies and Neurologic Function. <laughs> um, and so I went up there and I met with Dr. Connie Tomeno, who had started the Institute with Dr. Sachs, and I met with Dr. Sta Dr. Sachs, and they started talking to me about the research they'd been doing. Because I, up until that point, I was familiar with what I'll call the realm of like unscientifically supported music therapy, which is playing music for people in hospital rooms, which is wonderful, but it's more anecdotal. You know, the, the client, the patient says, oh, I feel better, so clearly it's working. Um, or playing music for people before, during, and after surgery oftentimes could cut the recovery time down. But again, it existed more in the sort of like anecdotal realm. But what Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomeno had done was to take music therapy out of the anecdotal realm and try and, I don't know, actually look at the way that music affected the brain. Um, and because I'm sure everyone here is probably way smarter than I am. So if I say anything that seems self-evident or pedantic, I apologize. Um, I'm used to talking to dumb people. <laughs> and uh, so up until let's say the early to mid eighties, and I'm speaking very broadly here, I think most neurologists worked under the assumption that our brains had a finite number of neurons. And that once you got to a certain point, the best you could do with your neurons is try and keep them from dying. So like wear a helmet and don't breathe model airplane glue. Um, which, who, a model airplane, I've done a lot of drugs. Model airplane glue is like at the bottom of the list as far as fun <laughs> drugs. So I never run, I mean, it's available, it's cheap, but. Uh, so that, but then in the, in the 80s, generally speaking, um, neuroscientists en masse discovered that the brain was capable of creating new neurons up until the day we die. You know, that there wasn't just this inevitable sloughing off of neurons from the time you were 10 until death. And, um, 
And what they, the neuroscientists, learned is that neurogenesis, this process of creating new neurons, was very much the product of lifestyle choices and cognitive choices. And they, realized, they learned that you could create billions of neurons a day by eating well, by being optimistic, by having a good social network, by loving the work that you do, by having a spiritual life, um, by exercising. And the opposite of these things, by smoking, drinking, taking drugs, being isolated, being pessimistic, those things inhibited neuronal growth. And Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomato, in their research, learned that one of the greatest sort of progenitors of neurogenesis, proponents of neurogenesis, was music. That in their research, almost nothing promoted neurogenesis better than listening to music, which they were sort of amazed by. Because up until this point, music therapy was anecdotal, like, oh, I like hearing guitar, therefore it makes me happy. What they learned is that when you're listening to someone play your favorite song or you're listening to your favorite song, it actually changes the brain in remarkably positive ways. Um, it decreases the stress hormones, the norepinephrines and the cortisol. Uh, it increases dopamine, it increases serotonin, it increases neuronal activity, it increases neurogenesis. Um, and then they realize something that sounds miraculous, but I've seen it, I've seen the video and I've seen it up close, is people like aphasic patients, people who've had strokes, people who've lost chunks of their brain to brain damage. Um, let's say you've had a stroke and you've lost the ability to speak, or you've had a stroke and you've lost the ability to walk. Through music therapy, you can still sing and you can still dance. And it sounds like nonsense, but I've seen it documented. And these are legitimate scientists doing this work where taking an 85-year-old woman in a wheelchair and she's sitting there and she's not terribly responsive and you play her favorite song and, her, and, maybe, and she can't move her legs, you play her favorite song from when she was 10 years old and her feet start tapping. And if you help her to stand up, she's actually able to stand and shuffle around and you turn the music off and she sits back down in her chair. Because broadly speaking, and the same thing with speech, like someone who's lost the ability to speak, you play their favorite song from the, when they were a little kid and all of a sudden they're able to sing along. I mean, it's not like American Idol style singing along, <laughs> but they're, they're able to, to vocalize. And in very broad terms, what Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomano have learned is that music affects the entire brain. Because a lot of, and I'm speaking as a, former philosophy major who's not a neuroscientist, I'm a dilettante, so if I'm saying stuff that's egregiously off and there are neuroscientists here criticizing me in your head, by all means feel smug and self-satisfied and criticizing me because <laughs> I'm just a dilettante. But, um, so there's you know, the, the 19th century idea of phrenology, that the brain has these specific regions and of course the 19th century phrenological map of the brain said like this is the crime region. This is the region that makes you like the church. This is the region that makes you like pies. Um, and it might not be that quite that specific, but certain, as we all know, certain parts of the brain do very specific things. So if your speech center is damaged, you lose the ability to speak, which seems very self-evident. But what they found with music is music somehow affects the entire brain. You know, when you're listening to your favorite song, there are certain areas of the brain that are specifically lighting up, but the whole brain responds. And so, in a way, the work that they've been doing is finding out that music enables people who are aphasic, who've had serious brain trauma, to bypass the damaged areas. So it's almost like it's bypassing the speech center to, to access the music center. And they've done truly remarkable work where like, by, but by doing this, it's almost like the idea of physical therapy. Like recently I tore my rotator cuff and the physical therapy for the rotator cuff isn't addressing the torn tendon, it's strengthening everything around it, which enables the torn tendon to have more fluidity and to eventually heal. And broadly speaking, that's what happens with music therapy in the brain. It, you have the damaged area and then, but music, is affecting everything around it and eventually the damaged area starts to heal remarkably. And 
if I was just reporting what had been told to me, I'd be a little suspicious, but I've met the clients and I've seen the documentation and they've been doing this research now for about 20 or 30 years, um, very fastidiously. So it's really, really remarkable work. And what, it, what this did for me, because up until the time I started working with Dr. Sachs and Dr. Tomeno, as I'd said, I just thought music was fun. You know, I thought music was this light-hearted, light enjoyable thing that suddenly made me more attractive to women <laughs> and was wonderful to listen to. And, and I never questioned. I started, but then I started thinking more about it, and I started, oh, that's relaxing. <laughs> um, it's like an old Wyndham Hill CD. Uh, and... <laughs> Really? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I wasn't really. I was, um, so when I stopped to think about music and how true, I mean, it was ubiquitous. It was in my life. It was what I dedicated my life to. But it was also, it was cheap. Now it's free. It's, you know, it's the most common thing in the world. And we can access it anywhere. And then I took a step back and I started thinking about it. And I thought, well, what is, what is music? Because we all, it's so, it's like the Bill Clinton, like, what is the definition of is? You know, um, like, how do you define the familiar and the ubiquitous? And music was fascinating to me because it has absolutely no definition. It doesn't, it's, as far as I can tell, it's the only art form that technically doesn't even exist. Because it's not, all it's doing is moving air molecules a little bit differently. You know, like right now what you hear is structured and that's my voice, but it's also chaos, you know, papers, birds, etc. But did that, so we can call that unstructured sound. And unstructured sound is just air moving a little bit differently. If I was playing music, it would be the exact same thing with a little more frequency you know, with a little more pattern and regularity, but nothing's being created. It's just this same amount of air, you know, this fixed amount of air hitting our eardrums a little bit differently. And then what amazed me when I that realized that is that music can make people cry. It can make people laugh. It can, they play music at funerals and they play music at christenings. They play music at the Olympics. They play music when they're sending armies into war. Um, it can do anything. It can make people have sex. It can make people get regrettable tattoos. It can make people <laughs> move from one country to another country. Like, it's this remarkable, powerful force, and we all collectively give it short shrift. Like, oh, I love music, but it's music. Let's just push it aside. And so when I started working with the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function, it was almost like Dr. Tomeno and Dr. Sachs showed me that music isn't just fun. Like it can be fun, but it's a remarkable, now proven healing modality. Um, of course, and not surprisingly, they're having a very hard time getting federal funding for their work. Um, and not to sound like too much of an old lefty. And by the way, it's funny being like a progressive lefty in the David Koch building. Um, <laughs> It's like that Hugo Chavez thing when he, I remember he addressed the UN years ago and he got up on stage after Bush had been there and he said, I smell sulfur, has the devil been here? Um, so, um, where was I? Hugo Chavez, David Koch. Um, federal, funding. federal funding, yeah. There's no way to make money from music therapy. There's no way to monetize it. It's music. And, and as a result, of course, let's just say the pharmaceutical um, industry is not lining up behind music therapy as a modality that they can support because there is absolutely no way to profit from it. And as a result, the Institute is having a very hard time getting federal funding. We have a lot of supporters in Congress, a lot of people who are amazed by the work, but you can imagine good old Oliver Sacks and Dr. Connie Tomeno working in the, <coughs> South, the South Bronx at the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function, going to Congress up against 
big pharma. Like, it's, it's ludicrous. So it's one of my hopes is that eventually more funding will be given to the institute or other institutes, other places that are doing serious scientific research into the healing effects of music. Um, so if anybody here is a remarkable lobbyist and you want to help people, um, and, and also, and so in addition, I, I talked about music sort of as a healing modality that has helped aphasic patients. One of the other remarkable things the Institute has done is it discharged people with early Alzheimer's. When people have early onset Alzheimer's, as we all know, sadly, tragically, horrifyingly, it is just a death sentence. The Institute is the only place, I believe, in the world that has discharged patients with early onset because they've actually been able to sort of like reverse the symptoms through music therapy. I mean, it's truly, truly remarkable work. Um, and before we go to questions, because I really like getting questions, because then you can see clearly how much I don't know. Um, <clears throat> this made me think, like, okay, so music is free, it's ubiquitous, we all love it, but we all give it short shrift. It made me think of, like, what other things in our lives are we downplaying? And there's a, a neuroscientist on the Bay Area named Rick Hansen, who I really like, and he and others have done research into sort of the power of the mundane or the power of the things that we just take for granted, like puppies, community, fresh squeezed orange juice, nature, you know, these things that were like, oh, those things are all nice, but clearly they're not really benefiting me. And a lot of work has been done recently showing that like these healthy things in our lives aren't just fun, they aren't just nice, but they have remarkable healing powers. Um, and again, not anecdotal healing powers, not like, oh, I go into nature and I feel better. That's nice. It's nice to feel better. But when you can actually show, you know, through new MRI imaging, through PET scans, through endocrinology, um, showing that these things have, these very commonplace things have remarkable healing powers. And what a lot of neuroscientists have been realizing is the healing power of a lot of these things, like a dog, a loved one, fresh squeezed orange juice, your favorite song, is amplified by the amount of attention you give it and by, the, by how much you notice how, like the strength of its healing. So if I sit down and eat a perfect organic orange, sorry Monsanto, because um, <clears throat> I know, they're, I know they're, they have all our best interests at heart, right? Ha <laughs> oh boy. Um, so if I sit down to eat a perfect, organic, non-Monsanto orange and I just ignore it, like sit there, read a book, eat the orange, like I get benefit from it. But if I really pay attention to it and really enjoy the experience, cortisol drops, um, norepinephrine drops. I still don't understand the difference between norepinephrine and epinephrine. But, um, and our, all, you know, all the stress hormones are diminished just by paying attention to this commonplace object. And it made me think how, and this is where I really start to sound like a hippie, sorry, because I'm bald. It's kind of weird being a bald hippie <laughs> in a David Koch building, um, which is a beautiful building, by the way. And I'm not, I mean, God bless David Koch if he'll support the Aspen Ideas Festival, if everything else he does is evil. I mean, I, I can just imagine him, he gets to the gates of hell and Satan's like, David, my old friend. Um, and David's like, oh, I did all these terrible things, but I gave them a nice building. And the devil's like, oh, yeah, okay, so that doesn't count. You're still evil, um, but at least we get a nice building. So, okay, so <laughs> being a bald hippie, I don't, going on these tangents, I just keep losing my train of thought. Where was I again? <laughs> eating oranges um, oh basically how and it's almost like it's ingrained in us to trust authority we trust our doctors we trust our clerics we trust our priests we trust our teachers and to a large extent that trust is justified because a lot of doctors priests teachers what have you they're they're experts in what they do but one thing I learned a long time ago, this was when I first sort of woke up to the insidious nature of the man, was 
Years ago, I had hair. I know, years and years and years ago. And I remember being eight or nine years old in the shower, and I was looking at the shampoo bottle, and it said, lather, rinse, repeat. And I read the repeat, and I was like, oh, the shampoo company cares so much about me that they want me to wash my hair again. So I happily repeated. And then at some point, I realized, oh, no, they write repeat because they're self-interested, and they want me to use more of their shampoo. That was my wake-up call. And that's when I realized, like, the clerics, the priests, the institutions, the doctors, the pharmaceutical companies, like, they're self-interested. They're well-intentioned people trying to do good work, but their ultimate goal, more often than not, is self-interest. And we collectively defer to them and ignore the things that are in our lives that are already remarkably healing and free, like music, like community, like friends, family, sex, spirituality, nature, these things that you don't need a cleric to sanction for you. You don't need a doctor to prescribe for you. And it's been really interesting through the work with the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function to just see the power in what's already available. Um, and I see it with a lot of my friends where they don't trust their own innate capacity for healing. They don't trust the things around them. They trust a little brown vial that some pharmacist has prescribed to them. And I'm not maligning Western medicine because it does remarkable things, but as a culture, we're dying. You know, we're all sick. We, we eat food, thanks Pepsi, that is not <laughs> nutritious, that kills us. Trust me, there are a lot of great sponsors here. It's just they're Monsanto and Pepsi are not two of them. Um, so we eat food that kills us. We eat food that we poison our air and we outsource our health to the same people who are poisoning us. And I just think that there has to be at some point, like we have to grow up. We have to stop being children outsourcing our well-being to supposed experts. Because these supposed experts are just trying to be self-interested, which I can't even malign them for because it's in their roundup encoded DNA to be self-interested. Um, but I think it's really healthy and powerful if we can start recognizing the power of the things that are already in our lives, um, music being one of them. And if you, if you go online, if you want to research what the Institute does, as I said, it's truly miraculous work. And I don't mean miraculous with a small M, I mean miraculous with a big M, where people who can't walk can dance, people who can't speak can sing, people with early onset Alzheimer's <laughs> are being discharged. So. Um, I feel like I've rambled on enough and I really am looking forward to hearing any questions, if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, apparently we're supposed to go to the microphone. So if you have any sort of like agoraphobia or social anxiety disorder, <coughs> you don't have to, you could just sit there talking to your hand. This, this microphone? I think okay. so. Um, you said that aphasic patients who hear songs from their childhood can sing and dance. Mm -hmm. Do they have to know the song? What's the role of memory in this? And do your songs work? Um, that's, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I've, I've spent a lot of time publicly speaking about music therapy because um, I'm utterly unqualified. <laughs> and that is the biggest question. <clears throat> basically the objective versus the subjective, you know, the familiar versus the broad. And research has shown that familiarity does play a huge part in the effectiveness of music therapy. Um, if, if your grandmother, or okay, not, let's say someone's grandmother is aphasic and you play her um, Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin, <laughs> And if she's not familiar with that particularly dirty song, to her, it, it might actually like make her aphasia worse. You know, like, I'm not, <laughs> probably not, but like, or if you play her, like, like I love the band Pantera, play her a Pantera song and it might hasten her early demise. <laughs> play her her favorite song from childhood and all of a sudden she lights up. You know, and I'm, a lot of people here have actually probably had that experience. We've had that experience with ourselves. We just tend to discount it. You know, like you've had a bad day, you get in the car, you turn on the radio and Sweet Home Alabama comes on. And you're like, oh, great. Like all of a sudden you light up. And, but when we light up, real things are happening. 
you know, and it's real, like neurochemically, endo, from an endocrinological perspective, like real work and real change is happening. And, uh, but so yes, the, the subjective plays a large part in that. Having said that, I would say that for the most part, there are some universal compositional elements that people react to, you know, like, Baroque music with like long, slow cello parts and like long sort of sonorous melodic elements do sort of have a universal appeal, you know, which is why Bach sells really well in Japan. You know, if you compare Bach to like traditional Japanese music from let's say the 13th century, like they're utterly dissimilar, but there's a universality of certain compositional elements. But overall, the familiar does tend to increase the effectiveness of it. What about your music? Um, my music, I've, I've made a lot of quiet ambient music that I think, I hope, would have therapeutic effects even if someone wasn't familiar with it. But the rest of it, like the, the more song-oriented stuff, would have to do with associations and familiarity. You know, because music for the brain is also a remarkable mnemonic device. You know, it lights up all the memory centers. You know, like think of your favorite song, and think of a time when you listened to it with someone you loved. And all of a sudden, you can remember what they smelled like, what was going on, what the car was like, what the clothes were like. Like it's, you know, it really it triggers this phenomenal sort of like cascading avalanche of memory. So, I, I think they want us to use the microphone. Sorry, I'm not trying to... Phil, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, in all the work the Institute has done, have they been able to identify a difference between, in the response between listening to music and playing it, actually performing it? And if so, is the difference one of degree or of kind? Is it more of the same thing, or is it a different response altogether when you actually hold or play an instrument? Um, that's a really good question, because the, the Institute does a lot in terms of listening to music, but they also they foster the most adorable bands you've ever seen, <laughs> where they'll take, like, you know, the 90-year-old lady in a wheelchair, and she can't move her upper body, so they put a tambourine on her foot. And she sits there and moves her tambourine. And then they'll find like some guy who knows how to play keyboard with his left hand, but not his right hand, and then the music therapist themselves. And the truth is, and it's interesting, like from a scientific perspective, there's so many variables at play there. You know, there's the music variable, but there's the community variable, there's the feeling valued within a group variable because it's very encouraging. You know, no one ever says to the old lady with the tambourine, like, fuck it, you're playing. No, that was wrong, <laughs> you know. Um, so, and a lot, of the, a lot of the clients are in pretty rough shape. So they're in, they're in their hospital room a lot, by themselves, maybe by themselves, or they're in the common room which might not be the happiest place in the world. So for an hour, they get to go into this dynamic community setting where they're playing music. So I think the music is, of course, an important part of it. But I think from a research perspective, it'd be hard to, to say divorce from the other variables. Whereas like just listening to music, is a little, it's a, you can have a little more pure science around it, I think. Oh, thanks. Uh, really love your music. Really looking forward to the acoustic show tonight. Saw it uh, when you did it before at Belly Up, and it was fantastic. Thanks. Um, can you talk about the effect that minor chords and keys and dissonance have on us, why we feel this tension? Somebody showed me a video of the um, Beatles playing the Ed Sullivan show back when they played the Ed mm -hmm. Sullivan show, and they start off with just alternating between the one and five chords when this repetition that everybody knows and is familiar, and then the last time they play it, they add the seventh tone, yeah. and that, back to your comment about music and girls, that's when all the girls scream, and that's cool. <laughs> but what is it that's happening that mm -hmm. makes us do that? That is such a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> um, there, I, I mean, why, because, okay, the difference between major and minor is like the t air moving at the tiniest, like a low, slightly lower frequency, you know? I don't even know in terms of the number of cycles. I mean, I guess it depends on where on the keyboard you'd be, but 
everyone else, I mean, just broadly speaking, major is happy, minor is sad. Um, the difference between the two is so small, but it's the difference literally between laughing and crying. And it's somehow, I mean, that's a really fascinating question that like, like I, I do this, maybe if you come tonight, I'll do this trick on stage where I play happy songs, but do them in a minor key. And all of a sudden, they're so morose. <laughs> you know, if you play Sweet Home Alabama, and instead of D major, C major, G major, it's D minor, C minor, G minor, it sounds like the most heartbreaking, oppressive song you've ever heard. <laughs> and you just move things just the littlest bit. So it's a great question. I don't honestly know that anyone has the answer to it. So, oh, and so tonight, by the way, if you're coming, the way the shows work, the first show is an acoustic show. Um, so it's about 75 to 90 minutes of me playing songs with a violinist and a singer, uh, doing them very stripped down. And then the second part is a big, crazy disco rave. So it can be a little confusing. <laughs> Hi, so you've talked a lot about the restorative and the healing power of music for sort of the older um, generation. Um, and what I've seen in my own life is sort of the rise of music as therapy for children with disabilities. Yeah. So could you talk about um, its developmental impact or how impactful you think the research has shown in terms of children who have um, developmental delays? Well, I don't know as much about that because honestly, a lot of the work at the Institute has been with older clients um, because they tend to be the ones who need more long-term care. Um, <clears throat> and, but I do know that work has been done with people on the autism Asperger spectrum, and music can be very healing for a lot of people. Beyond that, I, I just assume that it's, health, that it's healing and therapeutic, but I don't actually know. So I, I apologize for my ignorance. As a, as a rabbi, I super appreciate you lumping clerics with the pharmaceutical companies as yeah. like groups that are, <laughs> only do things for their own self-interest. Yeah. But I'm, but I'm, 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 I stand by my statement. So, so I'm curious <laughs> about it. I'm curious about it because arguably religion, when done well, is actually a group of people making music together, including lots of people who have oh, yeah. quite poor voices. And so you would, think that, you would think that our goals are similar in terms of sort of what we're trying to achieve. Oh, I, I mean, clearly I was overgeneralizing. <laughs> and um, I guess what I was saying is it's our collective desire to sort of like cede responsibility to an authority figure or to an, to an authoritarian organization. And I'm not trying to lump all spiritual leaders into that, um, yourself included. And a lot of priests, rabbis, ministers, imams, etc., are doing remarkable work and are gathering people in remarkable communities and are not self-aggrandizing. Um, so I wasn't, in a way, I should rephrase that, I wasn't necessarily maligning clerics or the pharmaceutical company. I was more saying we collectively don't need to give power to these organizations, you know, because the organizations so years, okay, I was about to get in a lot of trouble and malign this organization I used to work with as if I'm not in enough trouble. Um, but I used to work with a very progressive organization. And when it first started, it was all about the issues. A few years into it, it became about fundraising to support the organization. And you'd, we'd have these meetings and we'd be like, what about this issue? And the criteria wasn't is this a great issue? The criteria was, will this broaden our base and enable us to raise more money? And that was when I realized it's rare when an institution doesn't become corrupted that way, where the institution becomes about perpetuating itself and not necessarily dealing with the issues. And of course, within those institutions, there are still remarkable people like yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, and well-intentioned people, but I just, don't trust institutions or the power we give them, for the most part. They can still do good work, and, but you're absolutely right. Like, gathering people together is healing and healthy and wonderful, and it can be done 
you know, in a synagogue. It can be done in a space like this. It can be done in a church basement. It can be done in a living room and still be this remarkable force for healing, you know? And, and because you are responsible for bringing people together, you're doing great work, among other things, I'm sure. Um, hi, I was wondering if you could talk about the dark power of music. I remember when I was in high school, I got obsessed with Pink Floyd's The Wall. Mm -hmm. And I fell into, I fell into, it's very embarrassing, but it's true. And I fell into a very deep depression, and I got into very deep, dark music, which I loved, and it just kind of overwhelmed me. Yeah. And it was, you know, when you're talking about how music affects your whole brain, that's when I really felt it the most in my life. But it wasn't a good thing. And I was wondering if your institute had done any work about the other side, the dark side. That's such, a, that's such an interesting question. Um, and again, a lot of that is subjective. You know, it's almost like musical semiotics. You know, because technically, as we were saying earlier, like music doesn't exist. It's just air moving a little bit differently. So when we have a reaction to music, we're bringing the meaning to it. You know, unless it's super loud and then it's hurting us. You know, but like, for the most part, it's our subjective, collective meaning making that we're applying to music. So when, when there's dark music, like for example, <coughs> it wouldn't be inconceivable that there'd be a person standing behind you who would come up and say, oh, when I was a teenager, I was very depressed and Pink Floyd's The Wall really helped me get out of my depression. It's, so I, I don't know, I think that's when it really comes down to the realm of the subjective. And of course, like when I was growing up, I was a depressed teenager and I loved Joy Division and I loved, yeah, dark, <laughs> like dark morose music. And it's that, that sort of paradox where like, it made me feel worse, but it made me feel so much better. Like the reason you kept listening to The Wall was because it felt good, even though it made us more depressed. So it's that, you know, the paradox of the subjective, I guess. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Hello, I'm a big fan of your music. I actually used it in a school project like last year, so thank you. Oh, do you um, know about Moby Gratis? Yeah, that's, that's okay. where I... So I started this, just in case you're a filmmaker or something, I started a weird website called mobygratis.com, and it gives free, free music to indie filmmakers, film students, and nonprofits, and it's 100% free. The way it works is if you apply, to you, like you send in a little request to use it, and if you don't hear back from us in 24 hours, it's approved. <laughs> Anyways, um, I had a really weird experience in fourth grade, I'm 17 now, and uh, where I was practicing the piano, and uh, there's a window next to the piano, I was looking out, and this bird hit the wall of our house, it must have eaten some berries that we have nearby that make them drunk, but yeah, okay, uh, so it hit the wall of the house, and it fell, and it didn't move for a really long time, and so that happens, we've seen it, we saw it all the time, birds die when they, they hit the wall of the house. Um, and I just kept playing, and I was practicing the Chopin piece. Um, and as I played, the bird actually started to you know, get up and waddle around and then flew away. And I don't know whether it's a coincidence, but it spoke to the power of music, I, I think at least. Um, I'm curious whether there's been any attempt in your institute by you or anyone else to engineer therapeutic music, and that you've, you've said you identified these commonalities um, in things that are helpful, but has there been any attempt to create new music that's geared specifically towards the purpose of therapy? Um, there, it's funny, there, there are actually two really very good and interesting questions there. One is, do animals respond to music? Which, pot, birds especially, I mean, you would think, especially Chopin, if you're like on the upper register of the piano, it might have triggered something, like, it vaguely approximates bird song. Could have just been a coincidence. But. Yeah. Um, I like to think that you, were, you, saved, you saved the bird. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and the other question of like trying to create healing music, yes, I do a lot of that. I make a lot of ambient music, but pretty much just for myself. And maybe at some point I'll release more of it. And I write music specifically that's calm, that's meditative, that's a slow, I don't assume many other people would want to listen to it, but it has, it's very calming for me. And, but like earlier I made a joke about an old Wyndham Hill CD. So back in my day, we had CDs. And had there CDs were these, yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like Grandpa Simpson. 
<laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so for years, people have been trying to do that. And it's, again, it comes down to the subjective. Like some new age music I find very calming. Some new age music makes me want to stab people. <laughs> you know, so it's so, but that same new age music that makes my teeth grind, that makes me want to like hurl myself out a window, other people might find very calming. You know, maybe it's the sort of thing that like the Koch brothers play when they're having their drug-fueled threesomes with Dick Cheney. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. While we're being hippies and talking neuroscience, I wondered what your uh, thoughts on natural harmonics and if you give any credence to that and if uh, neuroscience gives any, cre any credence to natural harmonics, like 432 versus mm -hmm. 440 tuning. Um, so you're talking about like the weighting of a keyboard? And yeah, with how the, how the my, standard tuning My friend is Jonathan done. knows everything about that. Mm -hmm. I, I know very little. I just know that it shifted over the years. You know, that like middle C 200 years ago is very different than what middle C is now. I don't no, I mean, there's a lot of it, it. It sort of enters that realm of like trying to trying to establish some sort of objectivity around music, no. and I don't personally, from a research perspective, there isn't much to support the idea that there are objective standards within music. They don't, that almost everything is subjective, <laughs> and I am also the worst person to ask because before, like when I was growing up playing in bands, we couldn't afford a tuner. Yeah. So we tuned our guitars to whatever was around, and we'd make these recordings. And I've, went, I've gone back and listened to them, and we were playing songs in E that were actually in D, mm -hmm. you know, or D flat, or C. Like we just had no idea what we're doing. It all sounded fine to me. So I would say if listening to like a like a 440 weighted keyboard makes you happy, great. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to like re-weight your keyboard, which you can do now because it's the future. Um, <laughs> and that makes you happy, then great too. But I don't, I don't know that there is much support for the idea of a, an objective standard. Cool. Thank you. So, um, and I think, unless there's one more question, I think that's it. Yes, ma'am. What is the name of your institute? The Institute for Music and Neurologic Function, also IMNF. And what, what do you do there? What do I do? I, yeah. I show up. And, well, they're based in New York, and I moved to California a few years ago, so I don't have as much direct contact with them. But I would show up, help them raise money. I gave them a lot of equipment for the studios that they've built. Um, I work with the clients, um, go around and talk about it, try and draw attention to it, get involved in lobbying efforts. So pretty much whatever I can, because it's... It just has been very, very heartening for me to realize that my life dedicated to music isn't just fun and self-serving. Like there is actual like proven healing power with music. So, oh, yes, sir. Yes, there are two, these are two, two questions. The first on healing, uh, what research has been done on music that's healing uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, et cetera? Where are they? Uh, as far as music and with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, were, it's... Were, were they actually uh, had patients who were in, in different degrees of very significant later stages? In that early stage? The later stages, I don't, I don't know that much about that. I know a lot of the work has been done with early onset Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, I don't know, and I don't know how much research has been done because the resources are quite limited. I assume though, <clears throat> With other with autoimmune disorders and whatnot, one of the goals is creating calm, you know, and music is remarkable for that. So I would just assume that it would be a very powerful healing modality in the fight against Parkinson's, but I don't specifically know, so I apologize. All right, now another totally different from the opposite side. We took a took a look at athletics, and then said, all right, are professionals or people that are very good at athletics calming down? On athletics, um, it might be out of your realm, but, but or it might not. yeah, no, I 
I don't, I mean, I, I think it would have to come down to the type. I mean, I'm, I'm just hypothesizing. Oh, no, a good example would be if the body relaxes, mm -hmm. the mind relaxes, the body relaxes, golf is a great yeah. example. It's a static move, and in golf, really relaxing really helps. It. Yeah. Well, I had, I had that experience years ago because I used to do a lot of kickboxing. And when I first, it's not that funny. Um, <laughs> and when I first started doing kickboxing, I would get so tired. Like after 15 minutes, I'd just be like exhausted. And I couldn't figure out why I was getting so tired. And I realized the reason I was getting tired is because I was tense the entire time. So the whole time I was like tensed up waiting to get hit or waiting for something. And when I realized that, I could then force myself to stay relaxed and I didn't get tired anymore. And it did make me think generally broadly how much unnecessary tension we bring to things and how sort of damaging it is to us both like neurochemically and physiologically. That's a perfect example because the tension that's created, I used to do a lot of boxing. Yeah. And getting, just getting in the ring, the tension of the body, if you can relax all that, your, your ability to move feet, hand, eye, and yeah. Um, so I think we're done. Um, one last thing. I've been hiking all morning, so if for some reason I stand near you, I'm a little stinky. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>